heat of the rolling world can't be turned away. An enchanted moment, and it sees me through. It's enough for this restless warrior just to be with you. Friday. Are there any other announcements? As is, has been our custom for a long time, we light two candles when we meet here. One candle is a candle of remembrance, and we light that for veterans, for first responders, for our service people, and their families, and all those in harm's way. We also light a candle of peace. That candle reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, our community, our nation, and in the world. Please join me in the call to worship. What can I offer the Lord for all God's goodness to me? 
I will bring a wine offering to thank God for saving me. In the assembly of all your people, God, I will give you what I have promised. How painful it is to God when one of God's people dies. You have saved me from death. I will give you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and offer my prayers to you. Please join us in hymn 685, Now on Land and Sea Descending. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. God of grace, you welcome us to the table of our Lord and give gifts more than we deserve or desire. We are grateful for Christ, who feeds our faith and renews your covenant with us, who by his death gives life to all who trust in him. How can we thank you for his love?
as an expression of our gratitude, God, to give you thanks for Christ. Give us a willingness to serve as Christ has served us. Amen. I'm told that uh, it is uh, now allowed to pass the peace and worship. I encourage you to do it with uh, some thought in mind for what makes people comfortable and what is responsible, because we are still in the midst of a pandemic. So I encourage you to pass the peace by approaching each other not too close, and, and you can offer a bow or, or a wave or some sort of a gesture that and, and declare that you're passing the peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share with one another the peace of Jesus Christ. Let us follow that up with the hymn 92 for the beauty of the earth. Our scripture tonight is from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and has re had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. For the word of God within us, be to God. for the word of God among us, for the word of God in scripture. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, just imagine that that's what I'm asking of you tonight. To take a minute to imagine what it must have felt like to sit at table with Jesus that night. Imagine sitting there knowing that he was going to be taken away and soon. The disciples must have been thinking but he's, he's here, alive as can be, eating supper with us now. Maybe, maybe they even laughed at a joke shared around the table. Their lives had been changed, totally, because Jesus had called them and joined with them in community. They'd gone through so much together. Healings, threats from leaders in communities, crowds kicking up dust, getting hungry, people demanding Jesus' attention or the disciples' attention for that matter. And three of them had been there on that mountain. That day when, when they saw Jesus talking with, with Elijah and, and with Moses in that dazzling light. All of them had spent some time going, going off two by two into other towns and, and villages to heal to teach, they learned from him how to pray. 
They learn from him to turn the other cheek and then to shake the dust off their feet and just keep going when, when they were not welcome or when they were misunderstood. Because what they had, what they brought to people was, was a vision, actually, of God's kingdom or of God's coming realm, a new way of being in the world. It's what they offered to anyone who was interested. They'd left their families in order to make a new family with each other and, and with their teacher their spiritual guide, their mentor, their friend. They had grown to love him. E even as he challenged them and, and pushed them to continue to grow and, and to change, they'd learned to rely on him for help. They relied on him to give them, them answers that they didn't think they, they could ever find themselves. And, and sometimes they really couldn't because he really was one step, 10 steps, 100 steps ahead of them. So they needed him to lead and, and to be able to follow where he went. So can you imagine? Can you imagine what it felt like that night to, to be with him at that table and to know that, that very soon he was going to be taken from them and probably violently and then in, in the hands of the Roman governor and, and then Roman soldiers, he would, he would suffer a terrible death. They had no power to counter that. They couldn't stop it from happening. And I wonder if, if, if fear rose up in their chests at, at dinner that night and if their eyes teared when there was a lull in the conversation and when they remembered the danger that he was in, that they all were in. Or maybe, maybe when they imagined just for a second what, what life would be like without him there, loving them, feeding them, figuratively speaking, literally, laughing with them, scolding and teasing them, when they imagined that just for a second, did they rush to, to push that thought back down and to push it away? Did they tell themselves that that, that can't possibly happen? Is that what they did? Did they tell themselves again, remind themselves right now, Right now he's fine. Right now he's here with us, talking, eating. Is that what they did when really they knew? A part of each of them, a part of each of them knew. I, I, I think they were probably in shock, don't you? You know, there is a kind of grief that, that we all go through when, when we know we're going to lose someone we love. Call it anticipatory grief. It's about anticipating what will be and, and what it will feel like. And the truth is that we, we feel the loss we, before we experience it. You know, I have to say that I, that I learned about this a long time ago when, when I was in a training program 
with a group for a hospice that we were trying to organize in Utica. And together, we, we read a book about grief and about grieving, and, and the author of that book told a story about a, a family, all of whom were very stoic. They generally didn't talk about their feelings. They just went about doing what they thought needed to be done. Now, eventually, the father of that family got a terminal diagnosis and was told he had at most a year to live. The result was members of the family didn't talk about their feelings. But they did what they thought needed to be done. One Sunday after that, they, they had a garage sale to get rid of some of the items they thought they wouldn't need anymore. And the son, the oldest son, John was his name, he and his wife came to their parents' house to help out with the garage sale. And what happened was the women were, were out in the yard selling things. And John, the son, went to find his father, went into the house looking for his dad, and he found him just wandering from room to room. What's up, Dad? What are you doing? And his father replied, I just don't know what to do. John told him to come outside and help with the sale. And they walked through the garage, and when they did, the father stopped and looked at his workbench where he'd spent hours fixing things, and loving being there so. What's going on, Dad? What are you thinking? And finally his father said, John, gather up these tools and, and bring them outside, and we'll sell them here today. Are you sure, Dad? John remembered watching his father with each tool in his hand. His father reassured him. And so John began to gather the tools. And here's how the book describes what followed. John began gathering tools from the bench and from the walls and from the drawers. And he could picture each tool in his father's hand. When, when he was a child, he watched him work so long and so lovingly. And suddenly John began to feel sad. And, and before long, he was standing there in the garage alone, sobbing when his father walked in. His father put his arm around his son. And he said this, for all of us, son, for all of us. You see, John was grieving the loss of his father before his father was gone. And he was doing that for the whole family, for all of us. That's anticipatory grief. So what happens when we, we know what's going to happen and when we try to process it and we feel it before we experience it? The disciples that night knew what was about to happen. And like the father coming into the garage and putting his arm around his weeping son, Jesus comforted his disciples when he washed their feet, even as he was teaching them what love looks like and generosity and tenderness, too. Jesus knew probably more than anyone else that 
everything was about to change. That he himself would suffer before he returned to God. That that the disciples would, would struggle to deal with that, to make sense of that. He loved them to the end, says the text. And he expressed it in such a tender act. In the face of his own vulnerability. In anticipating his own death, Jesus took off his outer robe and as though removing a protective layer. And then he washed each foot of his disciples. We know that included Peter. That, that's what the text says. Peter, who, who later denied three times that he even knew this man. And we know it included the other disciples there who scattered and abandoned him before the next day came. We, we know it included Judas, who, who was about to betray him. Do you wonder what Judas was thinking as Jesus knelt before him, unprotected, reaching for his feet? holding each one gently by the heel, then placing it in a basin of warm water? Did Judas harden his heart so he wouldn't be moved by this kindness? Or did a tremor of doubt pass through him? Did he feel any affection, any gratitude, any regret for the plan he had made? Did any memories flash through his mind of all the times when, when Jesus was kind to the most vulnerable people they met? We'll never know what Judas thought then. What we know is that Jesus washed his feet. And we know that just one chapter earlier in John's gospel, John has Jesus say, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. No exceptions, no one left behind, not even Judas. Now, the towel that, that Jesus used that day to dry their feet, it was tied to him, tied to his body. Could that be a, a symbol of, of how Jesus was tying the disciples to himself? Do you know what I have done for you, he says. He asks a question and he answers it himself. I, I have set for you an example and then the example became a command to love. To love one another, to wash each other's feet. Jesus gave a love that night that forgave all things. It's a love that calls us to, to allow ourselves to be cared for. It calls us to open our hearts to a love that outlasts sorrow, a love that, that can carry us through pain. It doesn't save us from feeling it, but it saves us from being alone and being lost in it. Tonight, Tonight, if we can imagine being there, we experience anticipatory grief. Tomorrow, Good Friday, we experience the shock of, of pain and death. Only later, only later do we discover 
new life and, and new hope and the presence of love with us in a new way. Amen. Will you pray with me? We come to you, God, full of much that clutters and distracts, stifles and burdens us, and makes us a burden to others. 
empty us tonight of, of gnawing dissatisfactions, anxious imaginings, fretful preoccupations, of nagging prejudices. Old scores to settle and the need to be right empty us of the ways in which we unthinkingly think of ourselves as victims, as powerless, as determined by age or race or sex. It's being less than we are or other than yours. Empty us of the disguises and lies by which we hide from each other and from responsibility for our neighbors and the world. Hollow out in us a space in which we will discover our true selves, whole hearts, forgiving spirits, genuine holiness, and from which we can reach boldly for a life abundant, not just for ourselves, but for the whole human family. In the spirit of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He also said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And finally, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Join me in our communion hymn. <laughs> be with you. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks for God is good. Let us pray. O God of everlasting love, we thank you for the gift of Christ, 
who on the night before he met with death took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. And we give thank for that, thanks for that. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you. Whenever you share this cup, do it remembering me. For as often as we break this bread and share this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we give thanks for that as well. We give thanks for all this as we join to pray as Jesus taught disciples and followers saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we break this bread, think to yourself, is this not the body of Christ? And the cup of blessing, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And let us pray once more. Gentle God, where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, despair, hope, sadness, joy, darkness, light. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in dying that we are raised to new life. Amen. Please join me in our closing hymn, which is 2111. We sang our glad hosannas. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>